that's what this grounding is really all about. It's about the immune system more than anything else. Yeah. On this week's podcast, I had the pleasure of talking to Clint Ober about grounding. This is something that I've never thought about in detail, but recently, as I mentioned in the podcast, my eyes were reopened to this when my friends, the minimalists, mentioned they'd had Clint on the podcast, talked about their use of grounding mats and how it improved their sleep. I went to his website. I looked at this stuff. I read a book of his. I watched this mini documentary on the website and I really found it fascinating. So I dove into the science a little bit and you'll see my conversation with Clint here. It's fascinating stuff and it's free and available to everyone. I think the grounding mats are a great intervention if you wanna get grounding while you sleep. It's something that I do, but they're not required. You can get grounding by going in any free body of water, the ocean, a lake, a river, grass outside of your home, even as Clint says in this podcast, sidewalk outside of your home. And historically, just like eating the organs of animals and never wasting these, an ancestrally appropriate diet, like an animal-based diet, we would have almost always been grounded as humans the consequences for this at the level of our immune system, at the level of inflammation are massive. So enjoy this podcast with Clint. And I think that many of you will benefit by, just like me, thinking more about grounding on a day in and day out basis. If those of you out there are suffering with conditions that haven't been fully improved with dietary changes, get a grounding mat or just get outside and put your bare feet on the earth in whatever form it is as much as you can. So enjoy this podcast with Clint. Okay, Clint, thanks for coming on the podcast. I'm really excited to talk to you today. Well, thanks for having me. This is, a, I'm looking forward to our discussion. You know, I, I think a lot about where we've come from as humans, but I admit that this grounding earthing concept is, was kind of a blind spot for me. I, yeah. I, I surf in the ocean, I walk around barefoot, but I wasn't thinking about it I think as much as I possibly could have. So I'm grateful to my friends, the minimalists, specifically Joshua Fields Milburn, who introduced us. Yeah. And yeah, I appreciate yeah. those guys, but I'm excited to talk to you about grounding today. So let's just start with this super high level okay. because I'm a doctor. I, I learned about biology and we're going to talk about a lot about biology today, but I haven't done physics since college yeah. and electrical stuff is, is not something that I'm well versed in. Like, what is grounding and, and what is going on when we like, when we walk on the earth in bare feet or when we touch the earth, what, what's going on there? Well, I think you have to start with the sun, first of all, because the sun is radiating, you know, sunlight and which is composed of, you know, photons, electrons, and they're spewing down to the earth and the earth catches a, a certain amount of them uh, based on the, you know, all of the, electromagnetism built around the earth and, and so on. But, but basically, as the, the earth is charged with free electrons that are primarily coming from the sun, and a lot of them are churning up from the molten core of the earth because the earth is spinning and just all the commotion that's going on. But anyhow, so the earth itself has a what we call a negative surface charge. The word negative means that it has an abundance a simple way to think of it is no charge, negative, no charge. The, the other way to think of it is that the earth is charged with, has an abundance of free electrons, like an ocean of water, a, an abundance of free electrons that are universally spread throughout the earth. And so <clears throat> these are free electrons that they only serve one real purpose that, you know, as far as what we're talking about today, they, they primarily, they can move rapidly and reduce charge. The most common charge that we as humans see discharged is lightning. That's an electrical uh, discharge, geomatic, you know, it's a global event. And, and then static electricity. A lot of times you walk across the floor, you go touch a doorknob or touch something that has metal or ground, and you'll get zapped. In order to see that electrical zap, that blue flame on the end of your finger, that's around three to 5,000 volts. Now, you, you know, there's a lot of people running around screaming about EMFs and all these craziness about it, you know, a couple of millivolts or 20, you know, whatever, whatever. But the real electrical event in our environment is static electricity. In nature, um, you can't build up charge on the body because there was nothing to create charge. You have to have, uh, you know, different um, dissimilar materials. And when they make contact and separation, they create 
So they'll give up electrons and then they'll build a charge on one side or the other. And so our bodies today, I mean, we are forever uh, charged with our, you know, um, environmental um, uh, charges from the fabrics, the clothing, the, the, the electrical noise in our environment and goes on and on and on. But, but primarily in, in nature, the very first amoeba that was ever, that ever evolved on planet earth was grounded. Everything was always grounded throughout millennia, throughout from all time, because we were in contact with the earth. And when you touch the earth, then your body absorbs those free electrons and equalizes with the earth. So if the earth has X number of pro rata per square inch, your body's going to have approximately X, X many per square inch. And so, but you equalize with the earth. You, the simplest and the sim- most simplistic concept to get this across, I think, is an electrical. In I, mean, I come from the communications industry where everything has to be grounded to the earth in order to create electrical stability, constant everything, to reduce noise, and most of all, to prevent fire. Um, <clears throat> when you think of electrical, you're always thinking of fire because uh, if there's any resistance or things, you're going to blow a fuse or you're going to you're going to cause an electrical event and, and do harm. Um, so uh, in the body, uh, throughout all time, uh, from the very beginning, all life on this planet was grounded. It was uh, charged with Earth's free electrons. And when something is grounded to the Earth, whether it's a wash machine, a computer, uh, you know, an electronic amplifier, a receiver, I don't care what it is, anything that's electric, if it's grounded to the earth, there's only one reason you ground it, you know, to reduce noise and to prevent fire um, <clears throat> and to maintain electrical stability so everything functions perfectly all the time. It's like we would be hard pressed to have this discussion via these, these uh, mechanisms without, you know, all the systems in between being electrically stable and grounded. You don't have the glitches. You don't have all of this stuff. So, but very simple the grounding is about maintaining uh, the electrical potential of the earth. And there's only one reason that you really want to do that, to prevent fire. And in the case we're talking about today, we're talking about fire. Because the in, in modern days, you know, everybody's, you know, it's like when Ritger and the boys back at Boston Mass came out with that study in 2004, published it. Front cover of Time Magazine said, you don't have cancer. You don't have this. You don't have cardiovascular. You don't have all of these things. What you have is chronic inflammation. And it manifests differently in different people based on your genetics and your living environment and your lifestyles. But you can't have any of those health disorders if you were to get grounded to the earth and stay grounded because charge cannot exist in a grounded object. That's why we ground everything electrical. That's why. But we didn't have to think about it as humans uh, until 1960 about because that's when we invented plastics. First thing we did is put them on our shoes and we lost our ground and nobody even recognized that it was that we lost it until we saw this chronic rise in autoimmune inflammation related health disorders that is still growing exponentially to this very day. And what happened over this last 60 years, 1960 to you know, to 2020 is <clears throat> 65 years now is um, about 95% of all people wear synthetic sole shoes today. We're back in 1960. It grew gradually. And it's like you can see the autoimmune diseases if you put them on a chart starting in 1960. Diabetes was one of the first to show up. And diabetes is an inflammation related health disorder. It's in the literature. Um, <clears throat> but anyhow, so. As these autoimmune diseases begin to manifest, then all of these health disorders begin to manifest. The named popular health disorders, the, the ones that everybody have modern health disorders. Uh, and I call them environmental health disorders because we changed our environment. We used to be grounded, now we're not, and our bodies are on fire. And that's what it caused, that's what allowed all of this to proliferate. Uh, you can take charge of this conversation. <laughs> I'm, just trying, I'm just trying to. Uh, I give you a concept there, but, but the real thing you have to hold in your mind to make sense of this, it's not believable until you experience it. Um, and most people who 
unless you have chronic pain or chronic degenerative health disorders, it's hard for you to recognize it because we adapt and adapt and adapt and we become used to our pains and our problems. Uh, and only when you ground yourself and the pain begins to melt away and the, you know, blood viscosity begins to normalize and your respiration, your O2 saturation comes up and all these things automatically within a few minutes, then you say, oh my gosh, there's something going on here. What is it? And it, it's, that's what we can discuss throughout our conversation. But, but basically it's, um, it's an accident. In 1960, we invented plastics and we put them on our shoes and we carpeted our floors. And then over a period of years, everybody is living in modern home. If television came along, everybody went indoors, spent more time on television and then satellites and computers and everything else. So we changed our environments completely. We are no longer, uh, you know, critters of the earth or, or uh, lifestyle. We, we no longer live in touching the earth. We're no, no longer electrically connected to the earth. But throughout all time, throughout all evolution, throughout all time up until about 1950, 60, that time frame, we were naturally grounded. And yeah. to give, yeah. you, give you one idea real quick. The, in 1960, I, 90% of the visits to a practitioner were for infectious disease, acute injury, and childbirth. Now, 90, over 90% are for an inflammation-related health disorder. Fixed my son's eczema. Check out this review on histamine and immune from Heart and Soil Supplements. This is a cool one from Jason. He says, my son came down with a large patch of eczema on his inside elbow. I first thought it was just a rash and almost looked like a reaction to a large gauze bandage. I forgot about it, but... Two months went by and I looked at it again and it was exactly the same. I felt horrible that I had forgotten to follow up. I knew it was most likely diet influence since nothing new has been introduced as far as shampoo, body wash, etc. But it's hard to get a high school kid to take nutrition seriously as much as I try. I by chance saw an email from Dr. Saladino with histamine and immune. I ordered a bottle and lo and behold, after one day of taking them, the next morning, it was half gone. By day three, there was total remission. I talked to my son and found out he never even took the cortisone cream that I'd gotten for him. I canceled the appointment with the dermatologist. Thank you so much for Heart and Soil for the histamine and immune supplement. I am now a believer and ordering more today. I'm gonna to try some of the other organ supplements. So histamine and immune is an amazing supplement from Heart and Soil. It contains thymus and spleen, two of the most active immune organs in the human body. It also contains liver and kidney. This has been helpful for so many people with seasonal allergies or allergic conditions. Kidney also contains something called diamine oxidase, DAO, which helps with histamine sensitivity. So if you have skin rashes, allergies, consider trying histamine and immune from Heart and Soil. All of our supplements are made with desiccated organs that is freeze dried to preserve the most number of nutrients from grass fed, grass finished cattle in New Zealand. They're always packaged in glass. Plastic is bullshit. And I strongly believe these are the highest quality desiccated organs on the planet. As I mentioned in this podcast with Clint, I feel so proud of what Heart and Soil is doing. And I'm so excited to help people get more organs into their lives. Just like grounding, I feel like organs are a game changer for humans because of the unique nutrients, cofactors, vitamins, and minerals they provide. You can find us at heartandsoil.co. So, okay, that was a lot. Let me try and break this down. So, what I understand is that. The earth is full of electrons. And I like what you said. The earth is sort of a sea of electrons. Electrons are kind of a strange thing to me. They're like sort of a particle, sort of a wave. We don't really have to define what an electron is. Right. And, and am I right in saying that the electrons are coming from the sun? I guess, are they a part of photon? I mean, photons are little packets of electricity, and energy right. and information. So right. there is some there is some supply to the earth of these electrons. Yes. And there okay. And you described this the cycle with lightning. Now, one of the things that was interesting for me when people see lightning, is lightning kind of like a static electricity discharge? Because doesn't lightning go from the does what what direction does lightning go? Does it go from the atmosphere to the earth or from the earth to the atmosphere? I remember hearing that sometimes it goes from the earth out. Yes. Yeah. If it's, um, you know, first of all, how lightning is created is in the, in the morning you have, 
you know, the sun comes up and then you have evaporation and around noon, you have the highest point of the highest temperature of the day. And so the evaporation, as we turn like to get towards two o'clock, then we have condensation. I mean, the, the, the vapor comes together and then it builds up the clouds and so on. It's like where you know, down south, more where you are down around the equatorial region. Uh, <clears throat> most of the lightning strikes are occurring at where it's two o'clock on the planet. The earth is spinning, two o'clock is constant, but the earth is spinning. And wherever it's two o'clock, and that has to do because the sun is stationary and the only thing that's spinning is the earth and you want it. <laughs> mm-hmm. but, but, but anyhow, so at two o'clock, the, when the condensation, uh, the vapor starts to condense, then <clears throat> you, you get charge imbalances. You'll have a, a negative charge at the top of the cloud and a positive charge at the bottom of the cloud because electrons tend to repel each other. So the electrons on the Earth will push and repel the electrons, uh, the negative electrons on the negative side of the cloud. So anyhow, you have a a positively charged top or bottom and a negatively charged top. And so those have to eventually equalize. Uh, And so then uh, there has to, in order for you to see lightning, there has to be an equal amount of opposite charge on the surface of the Earth, kind of wells up. And once that charge becomes big enough, then it can create a fissure, you know, crack crack in the plasma between where the cloud, where the charge is up there and the earth. And then electrons can go up or down that channel. But most of the time, uh, electrons are probably going up. (laughs) But when you see lightning coming out of the side of a cloud hitting a mountain, that's coming down. But it can be either way, depending on, on the charge potential and the difference in charge potential, but generally I would say more lightning goes up than down. It almost sounds like Ghostbusters stuff. <laughs> you know, it's like there's a crack in the plasma yes, and, the, and the charges are moving. I remember, I remember one time I used to run a lot. Um, I, I don't do distance running anymore, but I used to be an ultra runner and I like to run up mountains. I, I've now sort of decided that's maybe not great for long-term hormonal health for humans, but that's a whole separate story. Um, and I was running on a mountain yeah. in Flagstaff, Arizona. I was running on the top of Mount Humphreys. Yeah. So 12,600 yeah. feet, I believe. And there's a storm rolling in. <clears throat> and m- some people who spend time in the mountains may have experienced this. <clears throat> but my hair, which was longer at the time, starts to stand up on end. And there, there are times when I've been out running in the mountains that I can actually feel this perhaps this gathering of electrical charge in my body and my hair is starting to stand up on end. I never got struck by lightning, but it scared the shit out of me because you can actually feel, is that what's happening? Is, is there, is there a yes. coalescence of an electric yeah. charge in my body that's about to zip up to the earth yeah. through my corporeum? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're standing on the surface of the earth and, and you, your body is an antenna, meaning it's conductive. It's, you know, it can conduct energy. Uh, and, and so as you're standing there, then the electrons on the surface of the earth are welling up. It's a more, think of it more like a cloud of electrons. And, and these electrons are charging up on your body. But what's causing them to charge up your body is the positive charge in the, in the clouds. They're pulling and the electrons from the earth are, and they're trying to get together so they can create the lightning strike and cancel each other out and normalize, you know, the, the uh, electrical environment. They're going to cancel me out. If they do that, I'll be, cancel the human yeah. Yeah. antenna out. Let me, yeah. Let, let me tell you one thing about, I, I was in the communications industry for 30 some years and, and, and lightning is a, is a big thing. I mean, it's one of the biggest things going, especially with aerial plants like cable television and so on. But, but the, um, the people who who usually get hit by lightning and they are harmed by lightning is they're partially insulated or whatever, and the lightning hit, hits them first, then it goes to the earth. But in the process, it's got to burn a hole through a shoe or something in order to get there. <laughs> so if you're, and I'm not telling anybody to go do this, but I'm just saying in nature, if you do not go under, do not stand under a tree or anything like that, try to stay in open space and down low, but generally, lightning flashes over an animal or a human. I mean, it'll it'll just flash over because it's so fast. 
Um, but if you impede that path of lightning and slow it down just a bit, you're going to get burnt. <laughs> it's going to burn and it's going to fry your body. This is very interesting because another the same thing happened to me, very similar experience happened to me. And of course, so I'm running on this mountain at 12,600 feet in Flagstaff, Arizona. I'm wearing shoes. I'm not running barefoot. Yeah. And, and the shoes are insulating me. And maybe I'm touching a rock at some points, which connects me with the earth, but I'm, I am insulated. I, so I'm blocking. And I did not get hit by lightning then, nor have I ever been hit by lightning in my life. But earlier in my life, I was hiking the Pacific Crest Trail, which is a continuous trail that goes from Mexico to Canada. And I hiked the whole yeah. thing. And oh in goodness. yeah, it was a really fun summer. Uh, I did it with a friend and we it's 2,700 miles. But I'll never forget around Lake Tahoe, so in the Sierra, a similar things happened. It was the end of the day and I think it was later than two o'clock, but it was probably around two or 4 p.m. There was a, a rainstorm and there was lightning. And my friend and I were hiking and we were in the backcountry and there was lightning all around us and we were afraid that we were going to get hit by lightning. And so the same sort of thing happens. You can feel your hair standing on end and you can feel that, that there's a charge. And so I, I'm not advocating that anyone do this, but do I, did I hear you correctly that if you're in a situation, a survival type situation where you're afraid you're going to get hit by lightning, you should stay in an open field and touch the earth and not be insulated from the earth with your shoes? That's what I would recommend. Uh, I mean, animals do get struck by lightning and die from it sometimes, but uh -huh. it's very rare. Um, but generally, you want you do not want to impede the you know that current. I mean, you want it, you want it to flash over. Generally, it will flash over, and you'll feel it. You might get some heat, but you're not going to die. You know, not very many people die from lightning. A lot of people get hit by lightning, but they don't die from it. And the ones who die from it are the ones who were too insulated and the lightning had to get through whatever they were wearing in order to discharge. It's um, very interesting. Lightning, yeah. Lightning is massive. You cannot really say it's this or that or whatever. It's, it's immensely large, larger than you can imagine. Uh, and the power is so great. It doesn't matter whether you have shoes on or not generally, <laughs> um, especially if you have leather shoes on, it wouldn't be an issue. I mean, that would be like being barefoot. Um, so yeah, it's all over the place. But I, I lightning is always respect lightning. I don't care who you are, where you are, respect it. Yeah. 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 I, I think that the lightning is interesting because it illustrates this sort of negative charge. So just so for my own thinking about this, is a positive charge an absence of electrons? What what is creating a positive charge? Is it is it all just electrons which have a quote negative charge? We're getting a little metaphysical here, but what what creates a positive charge? charge okay a negative charge would be that for instance let's say we have two piles of marbles one of them has 150 marbles and one of them has a similar you know 100 marbles so there's a difference in potential i mean one has 50 more marbles than the other so in electrical terms if those are electrons <clears throat> electrons always want to get to zero they want to, uh, to be no charge you want to eliminate charge because charge creates fire. Okay. <clears throat> I mean, the rapid movement of charge, that's what the electronics industry, the chip industry, everything, very, very sensitive to any kind of an electrical charge, even just a few volts sometimes. But, <clears throat> but anyway, when you, um, when you connect the two together, a positive charge and a negative charge, 50 of these marbles or 25 of these marbles are going to move over to the positive side. So now you're gonna have 125 marbles in each side, so there's no difference, no charge. It's just a funny way to explain all this, but, but, but you're trying to reduce any difference in negative versus positive. And the more negative, you can't have charge. Uh, it, it's like the animals who live in the wild, by and large. This may not be as true today. You gotta to remember, I'm 79 years old, so my, I think I talk you know, back in the 40s and 50s. And, uh, and that's my reference a lot of it. And, and, um, but animals who live in the wild, by and large, they don't manifest inflammation related health disorders. No, they don't no. have cardiovascular disease and, and they don't, they, there's a lot of cancer coming up in the animal world, but that's because we've destroyed or disrupted their natural environments and, and so on. But by and large, cancer does not exist in nature. It is against the laws of nature to have for cancer to manifest. 
because cancer is, uh, if, if, if that were the issue, inflammation would be issued throughout evolution. We couldn't have gotten here. Uh, it's all about our immune system also. It's, it's more about the immune system. And that's what this grounding is really all about. It's about the immune system more than anything else. Yeah. So Clint, when I, when I plug a light into an outlet, when I plug a light into an outlet, current, this is the movement of electrons, right? I mean, electricity, and again, I'm just thinking of my, this for myself because I'm very basic in my understanding of electricity and um, yeah. electrical workings of this. But it's interesting because the human body is quite electric and I want to get to that. But electricity is the movement of electrons. Is, is that true? Like current is the movement of electrons or am I wrong on that? Like if I plug an, a, 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 a socket, if I plug a light into the wall, how, how does that light turn on? Okay, well, what happens in order to make a light bulb light up, uh, you have a dam somewhere, you have a, a, a turbine or something somewhere that's generating electricity. And what it's doing, it's and today in our world, <clears throat> we have what we call 60 hertz electricity. That means there's a big round turbine somewhere, and then it's got 60 little magnets. And then that turbine spins, and as it spins, then the, elect the uh, electrons will go up and down 60 times a second. So they're not moving. They're not going anywhere. They're just becoming excited and not excited, excited, not excited. So, that is, so what you're doing is you're creating, um, you know, energizing. I mean, it's just energetic. Say. So anyhow, so now that current or that 60 hertz will travel down the metal, the power line, the power line. So the whole power line is sitting there going back and forth 60 times a second. And, um, <clears throat> and, and then when it gets to the neighborhood where you live, where your house is, you'll look up at the pole and you'll see a canister up there. And in that canister, this is what's called a step down transformer. So here you may have, uh, you know, 10,000 volts or hundred thousand volts, you know, on the power line, but then going into your home, Home, you're going to have like 240 or 120 or something like that. So they, with the use of coils, they can slow down that 60 hertz, the amperage on that 60 hertz. So it's, it's still 60 hertz. It's the same from beginning to end. There's no electrons traveling down the wire. Okay. The, okay. the same electrons that they, in the copper that was there when they built your house are still there. The only thing that is excitation that the dam does is create uh you know it excites the electrons 60 times a second and they go back and forth so now when the you have your own dedicated electrical system in your home it is not connected to the electrical power lines the only thing that's connected is you have a big transformer a little transformer and as the electrons go by this one and this one then they you control the voltage at the amperage. And, um, <clears throat> and so now, um, in your home, again, the current is moving on your home system. And again, you flip a light switch and then the electrons can go through the light switch to the lamp or whatever. And then on the other side of the lamp, it goes back to the neutral and it goes back. To, it's, it's a closed system to a, to a large degree. And, and so it's the movement of electrons that are wiggling back and forth on that light bulb that are causing it to glow. That's causing it to, everything to run. It's, it's different than what everybody thinks. You said amperage and voltage, because I, I want to understand what voltage is, because one of the things that's interesting when I read your book on earthing and I look at your materials is that you can measure, and, and this has been done with humans, we can measure the voltage in a human when we're grounded and not grounded and see that these are different. And so I want to make sure I understand what voltage even is, right? Because I, I, I watched this little mini documentary on your website and I see this story of you creating the first, your, your first grounding mat. And I want you to tell the story, but in, in that story, you, you had a voltmeter, I believe that you were holding and you could see that your voltage changed when you were grounded as a human. So what are we measuring when, we're, when you're holding a voltage meter or what is voltage? And then what is the amperage that you were talking about? Okay. Well, you know, amperage is like, um, if you have amps of power, that means it's like, um, you know, I, I don't, I can't remember all my amperages and everything, but you know, if I have a, 
um, 20 amp circuit. I can light, you know, like maybe 20 75 watt light bulbs. So if I need 40 amps, I mean, if I want to light more light bulbs, then I have to add more amperage or more amps, you know, and so on. Voltage is just a constant uh, between, it's a measurement between the surface of the earth, generally speaking, and and the voltage on the uh, the circuit, you know, the um, it, it's, it's difference in potential difference. It's voltage. Uh, so it's like <clears throat> when you stand barefoot on the earth, you're equal with the earth. Your body is, there is no charge. You are, there's no voltage. As soon as you take and put shoes on, then uh, six feet up, your uh, the voltage will increase maybe 150 to 300 volts at the top of your head versus the earth. But if you're standing barefoot on the earth, it's equal with the earth. There is no voltage. There is no charge. So voltage is a difference between where you are uh, relative to the earth. Everything is measured against, in the power system, everything is measured against the earth, the distribution system. So we have 120 volts of charge between the electrical potential of the earth and the potential of the system. And that's how we keep it at 120 volts because it's constantly monitored against the earth and the earth, the voltage of the earth will actually change. Uh, it can rise and fall depending on thunderstorms or lightning events, all kinds of events. But the idea is to keep that electrical system in your home at 120 volts so that your equipment which is built to operate at 120 volts. Right. Won't won't brown out or burn out. Is this like the marbles then? There's a charge. There's there's more electrons in one place than there are in another. Is that how you get a voltage? Is that how you get a charge difference? Uh, well, if you have 120 volts difference in potential between the earth, then now you have 120 volts of charge. Uh-huh. Okay. So there's, it's, um, yeah, it's kind of a challenge to explain <laughs> <laughs> but this is what happens when we have static electricity. I mean, this is what happens with lightning. This is what happens with static electricity is, is yeah. if I am shuffling across a carpet floor and I touch a metal doorknob, there's a transfer of charge there. There's, there's, yeah. am I, I'm, I'm changing my voltage in some way. And then it's being equalized when I touch the doorknob or something. Is that right? Yeah. Your voltage isn't really changing. The charge on your body is changing. Uh-huh. Okay, your body shouldn't have a voltage. It doesn't, okay. have, it does, it doesn't have a voltage. It, I mean, you, there are voltages in the body that you can measure. I mean, you can, every single cell in your body is electrical first, chemical second. If it's no electrical, it's dead. It's not, <laughs> can't be there. Okay, so everything is electrical first, chemical second. So you need electrical stability. You know, the, every cell has an electrical potential on the inside and the outside. And when they repolarize, that's how they bring nutrition and debris in and out of the cell and all that kind of stuff. So that's all an electrical phenomenon. It's not a chemical phenomenon. And um, so you want the body to be relative to the environment. You want the you want there to be no charge on the body because the body operates with charges. It creates its own charges. It does its own thing. And that's what you that's the electrical stability in the body you're trying to protect. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's like uh, breathing oxygen. We didn't have to think about it. We didn't have to study. We didn't have to scientifically even know what it was. And we didn't for billions of years. Or, but now, you know, we know. But it, uh, it, if it's gone, you, you're going to die. <laughs> right. Right. And so what you said earlier, I think, is really interesting and insightful that for the majority of our evolution as humans, 450,000 years as Homo sapiens, millions yes. of years before that as Homo erectus, Homo habilis, yep. we were almost always in contact with the earth. It, it's just interesting to think, you know, when I went to Tanzania and I see the Hadza, like when, you, when you're out, if you, I guess when you're out camping, you're wearing shoes, which are insulating. But if you're walking around the forest barefoot or using natural materials to make a moccasin, a deerskin moccasin or something to protect your foot, it's a natural material. It's, it's very difficult not to be in contact with the earth. And most of us who have pets understand this, that, that a, a dog is walking on the earth with their paws and bugs and insects and birds. Um, I guess birds are flying in the air, but they land on trees. I mean, fish are swimming in the ocean. They're always grounded. There's this grounding. And 
it was it was really kind of eye opening for me to think, oh wait, wow, I think we've gone very wrong evolutionarily in terms of our food, but I think that I haven't paid enough attention to this idea of grounding and the fact that historically evolutionarily we were almost always in contact with the earth, which is this concept of grounding. And for the, I guess for a little while, I don't know why I thought this, it sounded woo woo to me, like, oh, touch the earth, you're grounding. But when I started to look at your stuff and I thought, wait, I can measure a voltage on my body that changes when I touch the earth with a voltmeter. And I want to do this. I'll do this and I'll put it in my stories on social media, guys. That's crazy. There's, we're not talking about pseudoscience here. Like this is actual electrical movement of charges, right? I mean, did I get all that right? Yeah. It's physics. Yeah. And then yes. the next step yes, yes, to that yes, equation, yes, yeah, the next step to that equation that we were talking about, and we can move into this now, is the idea that could that physics have physiological consequences in the human body at the level of the immune yeah. system, something we call inflammation, which is a strange term that we can talk about. Uh, and because we know that the body is electrical, you mentioned this, neurons move with charges. And Let's yeah. talk about this next, because I saw this in your book and in one of the papers that I, I gathered from your book, that there, are, like, there's some hypothesis that the chi, that meridians, the chi meridians from acupuncture could be conductive pathways in the human body, and that, that certain parts of the human body are more conductive than others. Collagen, for instance, ground substance, yeah. this like, right? Yeah. These, they have a, a negative charge, right? So that, are there yeah. these... From your research, is there evidence of actual electrical channels in the human body? Are we essentially wired beings? Yeah, absolutely. We, you know, I spent 25 years. Uh, from, there's a whole story in how I got involved. In this. I was the last guy that I would think ever would be involved with what we're talking about. But, but anyhow, uh, I understood grounding and I understood electrical. And one day I just asked it, you know, a, a question out of the blue. I said, I wonder if there's any consequence to us wearing these modern shoes if there could be, uh, he'd be affecting us. And I didn't really know anything at that time, man. but I had retired when I was 50 years old. And I didn't have anything to do. So for 25 years or longer, 29 years now, I've been, you know, chasing this, um, this gorilla. But anyhow, um, <clears throat> let me try to say it is so that people make sense of it. Um, everything in the body is electrical first. We are an electron unit. We are a carbon-based electron unit. Lots of conductivity in the body. The body gates electric, you know, uh, you know, channels. I mean, the electric, elect, uh, electrons don't flow freely in the body because you know you, you got to create ATP. You got to do all these things. You got to, you know, the body knows what it's doing, and it took eons of time in order for it to evolve and develop a system that worked. And throughout all that time, it was always grounded to the earth. And that's why you had electrical stability. Now, only somebody with an electrical or bioelectromagnetic background really would make sense of some of this. But, but anyhow, every muscle, every single cell in your body is electrical. Um, so now, and they all operate with, they're all kind of like um, transceivers. They can transmit information like a radio station. They can receive information. They can receive it on nerves. They can receive it, you know, by, you know, energetics in the air, like radio waves and so on. Uh, the body is every, is all of these things combined. Anything that's in our, in our environment, any knowledge of any kind, whether it's the fanciest computer or anything else, it all came out of us. That intelligence already is in us. That's how we slowly invent it and reinvent it and reinvent it and improve it. But anyhow, our body works. It's the, it's the most electrical device on the planet. Um, and, um, and it's, and it's influenced by external electrical, uh, influences. And so anyhow, but here's what re-grounding is all about. And it was an accident that I discovered this and it was just a series of, of, uh, of events. And sometimes I, I think that I was just available. I had nothing to do with it, but something influenced me and kept pushing me and pushing me. And eventually I answered all these questions and brought to people brought the, together the researchers, the, everybody it took in order to gather this information and simplify it and make sense of it because it's not believable in the beginning. How can I just take my shoes off, put my feet on the earth and, and have inflammation disappear? And you can do it in five minutes. You know, this, you know. But anyhow, so it really 
for years in the, in the beginning, I knew I could ground a person. I could take an electro EKG patch, put it in the palm of their hand, connect it to a ground cord, go stick it into an electrical ground, and five to 10 minutes later, any pain they may have, any flaring uh, arthritis or whatever, <clears throat> it will instantly stop the inflammation. We did not know the mechanism of action when I started this. I assumed it was related to EMFs and all this crazy electrical charges in our environment. I later learned they have nothing to do with it. Um, it has everything to do with being connected to a reservoir of free electrons, which is the earth. The earth is the, is the most primal antioxidant because it's charged with electrons and it can receive electrons or, or give electrons. It's, it's kind of like uh, electrons can flow in and out of the body when you're connected to the earth as needed. Um, it's very challenging to measure some of those uh, because, uh, you know, a lot of this is at speed of light. You know, and uh, so so anyhow, as time went on, we kept searching and searching, trying to figure out what, why does grounding reduce inflammation in the body? Back then, the word inflammation didn't exist. We had uh, oxidative stress, but inflammation was you stubbed a toe or step, you know, broke an ankle or something. It would swell, balloon up, lots of pain, lots of heat, and so on. And um, and then then later. About one day, I remember I was, uh, I think it was Celier, uh, who I learned a lot from. And, and then, but one day I went to <laughs> the, the newsstand and here's this article. It says, you know, the front page shows a body on fire on Time magazine. And it says, and it had the word inflammation. And then down below it said, you don't have all these modern health disorders. What you have is chronic inflammation. And I understood um, what was going on, but they were talking about, it. but nobody knew how inflammation was being created. Was it lack of blueberries? That's what everybody thought for a while. Everybody was <laughs> stuffing themselves with blueberries. And it, I mean, it was pretty nutty. And, um, but anyhow, so one day I was sitting there reading some research papers on the immune system and how the immune system works. And I started reading about the neutrophil, how if you have a pathogen in your body, somehow it senses the energy of that pathogen and it's built into that neutrophil. And he'll swim over and he'll find this pathogen and it's kind of like a, a jelly cell and it'll wrap itself around the pathogen and then it will release what you call reactive oxygen species. Now, as soon as I read that, I said, it's electrical. The immune system is electrical. It's operating with charge. It's operating with radicals. Radicals are electrically, highly charged electrical particles. They are so powerful. Uh, the reactive oxygen in a neutrophil is so powerful. It can rip an electron away from the shell of a pathogen. And that's how the immune system destroys them. Well, and you know, we, we talk about radiation. I mean, what can you, what is there in nature that can rip an electron from anything? Nothing except the immune system. Uh, I mean, ionizing radiation, but that doesn't exist in nature except for the sun. And uh, so anyhow, I started down that path. And then again, I'm a cowboy. I grew up on a ranch in Montana. You know, you spend half your time out in the pasture and if something's wrong, you got to go fix it. <laughs> There's something wrong with the cows. You got to go right to the pasture, find out what caused the cow to get sick. You know, you do all this stuff, and um, and but anyhow, so but it, you, know, you use your intuition a lot. <laughs> you have to depend on nature. You have to depend on the resources that are available. And so, I've always had that mindset. If something's wrong, something caused it. What caused it? Let's go fix what caused it. To get rid of the problem because we we can't to keep the cattle healthy. Uh, otherwise, we don't make any money. And um, so anyhow, cowboy logic, if inflammation, according to Ritker, these people is, you know, electron, I mean, um, chronic inflammation is the immune system is attacking the body. That's what they used to believe. You know, the word lupus, the wolf, you know, they didn't call it lupus because a wolf will chew off its leg if it's caused it caught in a trap. And so they were saying lupus, you know, the body was eating itself, you know, and so on. That's how it all started in Germany many, 
many years back. But anyhow, so I said, okay, if we can reduce pain, you, in, you can't have pain unless you have inflammation. Pain is a byproduct of inflammation. So if you have any pain in your body, you have inflammation in your body. Um, so if we're going to reduce pain, and Stevenson, Dr. Steven Sinatra was very helpful in helping me, helping me understand this. He was a cardiologist. And uh, he said, you know, if you're going to research pain, you got you got to look at this inflammation because you can't have pain unless you have the inflammation. Uh, and so I started looking at that. Then I realized that basically when we're grounding somebody, what we're doing, because these uh, these reactive oxygen species, they're electrically charged. They're going to rip electrons away and they're going to create this uh, oxidative burst. And there's, it's, it's very um, crude. This is part of the innate immune system that goes back to the beginning. And, and so it's very crude and it oxidizes, it burns things, it, you know, tears them apart or rips them apart with acid. Um, so I thought, okay, what's happening here, the reason these, the inflammation is manifesting is because when I ground somebody, what I'm doing is I'm like putting their hand on the, in the, on the dirt. And their body, the skin is conductive, so it's absorbing electrons into the body. And it goes into the bloodstream. And we've actually done studies on this showing how within just a few minutes, it normalizes blood viscosity. The thickness of your blood automatically normalizes as soon as you put your hands and feet on the earth. And that's because these electrons are coming into the body. And then the blood is circulating once a minute. And all this, all these free electrons are now flowing through the body. And as after, you know, half a dozen circulation, then uh, it's pretty well distributed. So the first thing that happens is the blood thins because now they repel, the blood cells repel each other because they have neg more increased negative charges. They're like the earth itself. They're like a mini earth, miniature earth, an electrical charge on the surface and negative electrical charge on the surface. So now when they get close to each other, they repel each other like negative magnets. But if you don't have enough electrons, the little red blood cells will share electrons and stick together. And that's what's called Rouleau formations or thick and sticky blood, all that kind of stuff. That does not exist in the natural world. Thick and sticky blood does not exist in the need in nature. This is the zeta potential that you're describing, the idea that yes. you can measure the charge on the outside of a red blood cell. And yes. from your work, I learned about experiments that have been done with grounding where this measured zeta potential, and this is not pseudoscience, this is medical literature science, right? Yeah. So it, isn't it true that studies have been done, I, maybe Stephen Sinatra did this study, where, where you can yes. take someone who is not grounded, that is wearing insulated shoes or not touching the earth for some amount of time, and I want to talk about how long we should ground for, but, and you can measure the zeta potential, this electrical charge on the outside of the red blood cells, most people know that the red blood cells carry oxygen in your blood. And then you can ground them and you can see the zeta potential, the electrical charge on the outside of a red blood cell change. That's pretty wild yes. to me. And this is what you're describing. So I just want to clarify it for listeners that this probably accounts for the change in the viscosity of the blood. We learn about this Rouleau formation in medical school. I believe it's spelled R-O-U-L-E-U-X. Um, and, and we learned about something called the erythrocyte sedimentation rate, the, the, yes. the avidity, the speed with which red blood cells will clump together. And this is a measure of inflammation. This is a measure of sort yes. of how, quote, inflamed the blood is. But it's interesting to me that in these dark field images, which is a special type of microscope, I guess, that you can use to look at red blood cells, you can see changes in the way that these red blood cells associate with each other when someone is grounded versus not. That's pretty mind-boggling to me. Did I describe that right? Am I thinking about that properly? Yeah, you're right on. That's, you know, that's what blew our mind. We said that should have been the discovery of the century <laughs> because just simple standing on the earth normalizes blood viscosity. Well, half the population out there is on a blood thinner of some kind. And yeah, and so I want to back up and explain just back and just unpack these concepts of oxidation and reduction and inflammation for people. So yeah. inflammation, I think of inflammation as text messages sent between immune cells. It's, it's sort of this, this cytokine milieu. Cytokines are 
maybe you'll disagree, but uh, no, like cytokines. cytokines, cytokines are these signaling molecules that immune cells use to communicate with each other. And so inflammation is an activated immune system. And that certainly could be connected with changes in this electrochemical potential of the human body. But an activated immune system is an immune system that's kind of on fire. And, and when the immune system is on fire, is activated, it will use these substances, these reactive oxygen species to kill invading pathogens or to attack the, the human body. And so you describe this neutrophil, this immune cell that engulfs phagocytosis, another cell, and it can use uh, different types of reactive oxygen species, hydroxyl radicals, all sorts of things that the human body can create. And so yes. I just want people to understand oxidation. So there was a set of acronyms that I learned in general chemistry in college during my pre-med years that I, I keep coming back to and I cannot avoid even now as I'm trying to understand physiology and human health. And it's Leo the lion says ger. So L-E-O-G-E-R. Loss of electrons is oxidation. Gain of electrons is reduction. And so yes. when I think of oxidation and we think of oxidative stress, that's a word that gets thrown around a lot. Reactive oxygen species, oxidative stress. Well, oxidation is when a molecule loses an electron. That molecule is oxidized. And you were describing this, that that our immune cells are creating substances that rip electrons from other molecules and oxidize them. And then reduction is when a molecule in our body will give an electron to something else to sort of quench that free radical that is created when an electron is ripped from a molecule. So when you, when you oxidize a molecule, and correct me if I'm getting any of this wrong, when you oxidize a molecule, when an electron is ripped from a molecule, that molecule is oxidized and it creates essentially a free radical, quote unquote, a an unpaired electron. And then the reverse of that can happen in the human body with substances like glutathione, where electrons are donated in a process of reduction to sort of quell that reactive oxygen species, that, that free radical that's been created. So, so much of our immune system and life happens with paired and unpaired electrons. It's the movement of electrons between molecules. All of it. Is all of our health. Yeah. Did I get yeah, that right? Me, yes, but, uh, but I want to suggest something different. Please. Uh, <clears throat> when the immune system oxidizes a pathogen, like I said, that's a, a kind of a, very crude process. So there's remnants left over. There's remaining oxidative radicals that are left over. I mean, the, uh, anti, you know, the oxidants. And that's why everybody was eating blueberries because they wanted to wipe out the oxidants. <laughs> right. But, but anyhow, so what happened is when the body is grounded to the earth, it's never an issue because every single cell has a slightly increased negative surface charge. Not only red blood cells, everything in the body. In fact, you're just a micro bit taller when you're grounded because the electrons are kind of repel, like red blood cells repel each other. And so there's a push, there's an electro, uh, electromagnetic push. But anyhow, so, but the real, the cause of inflammation, why grounding? You can't have inflammation if you are grounded to the earth and stay grounded 100% of the time. That's evident in the animal world and in the plant world. Okay, so, you can have diseases, you can have all that, that's different. I'm just talking about degenerative oxidative stress. Okay, so the reason we have inflammation, chronic inflammation is because these remaining radicals are still left over, they're left over from an oxidative burst and they're only gonna last for a few nanoseconds, not time for enough for a blueberry to interact with them, but they're gonna last for a few nanoseconds and then they're going to steal an electron from whatever's in the vicinity. In most cases, that's going to be a healthy cell. Damage that healthy cell, then the immune system is going to you know, scream out to the immune system. Something's still here getting me. Another neutrophil comes over, replicates the process, and we set up a chain reaction. This is called oxidation, like lighting a fire, sticking a match to a piece of wood and lighting a fire and burning a log. Okay, so the reason that is occurring is because we are wearing shoes. We stopped, we lost our ground because when the body is grounded, the body is forever flooded with free electrons. It's measurable. And, and when you have free electrons, all the organs and all the systems of the body have a slight negative charge like the earth, inflammation cannot manifest. So we get lost and it's like a cytokine storm. And it's like we, we, we did a lot of work with a lot of people uh, in the last few years because 
the thing that took most people out during COVID and so on is a cytokine storm. And, and um, so all you have to do is take one of those electro patches I was talking about. And we've got a couple of papers on this on the earthinginstitute.net and a couple other docs. But you just put, it, put an electro patch in, like electro patch there. And then connects you to a ground, and all of a sudden the body's, the body's going to be flooded with free electrons. And so the inflammation automatically, so almost rapidly, just stops. It's, in, it's like pouring water on a fire. So when you connect, when you ground the body to the earth, then your body is going to rapidly equalize with the earth, pull electrons into the earth, balance out. So now the body is back to where it was in nature throughout all time. And you can't have this inflammation, this the inflammation kind of inflammation we're talking about and um so it's really loss of ground because this what i did for 25 years is once i restore ground then health returns health is the body's most natural state and if you don't have health then you're doing something that's interfering with your immune system's ability to maintain health it's not lack of blueberries that's that's kind of a joke okay <laughs> Yeah, and there's, it's there's nothing, inter- wrong, nothing wrong with blueberries. I like blueberries. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. It's interesting though because if you look at the medical literature, antioxidants for the most part, quote unquote, have failed to rever- to reverse chronic health conditions. I mean, yeah. there are multiple studies with multiple vitam- multivitamins and antioxidant substances, and they don't really work the way they're supposed to work. Um, they don't really prevent all of this illness, but. Yeah. It, it, it is very interesting to think about this sort of evolutionarily inconsistent way that we're living as humans and how that could affect things. So do you want to talk? There's a, there's a number of studies you talk about in your book that I think are very interesting. I mean, I have a couple of pulled up. Uh, we, the, the study, I think it's with 12 people and sleep and cortisol is very interesting and the normalization of the cortisol rhythms. I have a, a graphic I can screen share if you describe the study, but sure. this is very interesting to me. There's there's lots of interesting research with grounding that I wasn't aware of until recently. Like I said, I guess I thought it was too hippie. I mean, I like being barefoot, but it's it's compelling to me when I see research like this that shows that actual physiologic processes do improve when we just to connect, connect to the earth. And I know you've worked with Tour de France athletes in this bike race and wound healing. And yep. before we get to the sleep study with cortisol, did you did you do grounding with COVID patients? Oh, yes. I mean, we didn't. What we did is we wrote the papers and we, well, we have, you know, millions of people who use these products and, and the number one, and it's about people sharing their own stories. You know, um, it's, it's like if you have a, you know, an asthma attack or if you have, you know, it's like, I can go on and on. I don't want to get into too technical stuff, but, you know, serious, you know, it's like, uh, how do I how do I talk about it without saying it? I don't know. But anyhow, all of these modern health disorders, uh, you can't have them. You can't have autism if a person was grounded, because uh, that's a cytokine storm. That's a that's a storm that you know develops from whatever, whether it was this or that or whoever. That's somebody else's issue. But you know, you created a cytokine storm and then you put the child in bed and they went to sleep and they woke up in the morning and they were different. Okay, you can go on. Uh, it's like Cancer, does can, can cancer exist in animals that don't have inflammation? I don't think so. <laughs> you got to have a pocket of inflammation for the cells, a certain group of cells to get in and, and they end up creating their own uh, entity and then they end up creating their, you know, using that shell, that inflammatory shell to, to manifest and grow because they're out of communications with the adjacent cells and so on. So anyhow, it's, it's, uh, Inflammation. Inflammation is a modern term. It's hardly 20 years old. And we didn't know, nobody knew what it was because it happened accidentally. We started wearing shoes and then we lost our ground. And then our bodies uh, started to manifest with uh, diabetes and then lupus and MS and, and fibromyalgia came earlier because it's a precursor to those. And then all of these modern a cardiovascular disease is an inflammation related health disorder. Can you talk about the sleep, the sleep study? Yeah. Yeah. The, the one of the first studies we did, uh, I could go on for hours. No, <laughs> one of the first studies we did was uh, I did a study with 60 people that I got the, a little help from. It was an anecdotal study. 
because everybody said, you have to have more information. Nobody's going to believe you until there's, you know, 12, 20 studies. And I said, okay, fine. Just tell me what to do. Let's go to it. I wasn't too busy. Anyhow, so, but the, once we did the first study, then we recognized that uh, uh, it was affecting uh, sleep. People were had improved sleep when they started, when they were grounded, and they had reduced pain primarily. And then they had a host of other things that they would incidentally you know, mention uh, when they were being interviewed after the studies. But the, but the main things were sleep and pain. And so I ran into a, an anesthesiologist down in San Diego. His name was Dr. Golly, and he had just retired and he had all the knowledge I needed. <laughs> and because uh, he understood all of it. And he said, you know, and I asked him, I said, I want you to help me do a study. And and but we need some biomarkers. Uh, that makes sense. And so I said, uh, so he said, he, he was the one who suggested, he said, let's measure cortisol because cortisol is your fight or flight and it's, it's your stress hormone. And then I was familiar with, uh, uh, Salier and so on. So that really made sense. And so we went out there and we grounded a dozen women. If I remember right. Mm -hmm. And the first thing we did in the chart on the left side, you can see that we measured their cortisol every four hours for 24 hours, had them chew a little salivate thing, and then we'd freeze it, and then we'd send them to the lab. And then uh, I think it was six, eight weeks later, we went back and had them do the same thing over again. But the only thing we had them do in between was sleep on a 12 by 24 inch grounded mat. Small mat. Small mat. Very small. And at that time, because, you know, we were, we were learning as we go here. We weren't in the business of products. We were in the business of trying to identify what this was. Uh, Earthflex company I'm, uh, that I founded then was, it was a research and development company. <laughs> we were a product company. But anyhow, um, so anyhow, you can, when the, everybody looked at these charts, everybody said, well, there's something going on here. But what was most interesting, the most important thing we learned from this graph or these, these, the study was, at 4 a.m., cortisol begins to skyrocket. There's nothing in the environment. There's no signal cueing, signal cueing in the environment. It says, okay, time, sun's come up. You know, it's uh, time for cortisol to rise. So we're still in, in, the, in the dark of the night. And so that intrigued me more than anything. And I guess I'm a natural researcher. I don't know. But I started reading and started reading. And then because I'm from the communications industry. I went back and I, I started reading about you know, the telegraph lines in the, in the early days. They would only operate certain hours of the day, depending on where the sun was. You know, if you wanted to send a Western Union, it could only be sent at a certain time of the day and received at a certain time of the day because there had to be a difference in potential on the distances between the, you know, where the telegraph stations were. And it had so once it went dark, then the telegraph stopped, stopped working. And this was, and they were running through the ground. They, this was earth energy. This was not wires. They tried to improve it, but and wires was next. But it really started out with with uh, earth energy, the chi, what you call chi. And um, and what ten thousand years ago they called chi, <laughs> earth energy. Um, so. But anyhow, so anyhow, I, I kind of began to understand that this four o'clock rise in cortisol, what's cueing that, what's signaling that is as the earth turns mm. and you're getting closer to sunlight, then there's ripples. I mean, everything on the earth is electrical. The, there's the sun's hitting the earth and it's creating these big electrical energy uh, eddies, four of them on the sun side of the planet, four of them on the dark side of the planet, but they're very significant significantly subdued energetically and uh, so then i realized that okay as you're getting close to one of those then that's the trigger that's causing cortisol to rise and it's the only thing that we could ever come up with and so anyhow this was you know a rhythm in the earth not necessarily a rhythm with inside the earth but an environmental rhythm uh, based on sun moon and so on and uh, so, anyhow, that's kind of how we figured out. But so, and then we recognized, you know, the significance of all of these ladies, their cortisol synchronized. You know, before it was like spaghetti. The younger ladies had extremely elevated cortisol. The older ladies had uh, exhausted adrenals. 
And then when we grounded them for this six, eight weeks, they all kind of synchronized and normalized, except for the night workers, which are the ones that stick out on the side there, a shift worker. And uh, so uh, so the, the number one thing we realized that everybody had improved sleep and everybody had reduced pain and they had more energy. And, uh, and this is before we understood about the earth being the electron donor. <laughs> we were still kind of fishing around electric fields and all that stuff. But, but anyhow, I, as an end result, and, I, and what stood out in that study also that isn't in the study, we had three stewardesses from New York. And this study was done in San Diego. Their cortisol was three hours off. Their cortisol was three hours ahead of these people in San Diego. So <clears throat> then we eventually learned that's what creates jet lag. So when you fly somewhere and your cortisol is off three hours, you're going to feel like you have acid running through your veins. And, and so we did, this is all cowboy logic, just piecing, piecing and parsing and pasting things together to make sense of it and pushing it on down the road. <laughs> Um, but yeah, cortisol is, if you're not sleeping at night, it's very simple. You have elevated cortisol. You're thinking about something. Could this be used to help a jet lag? Because next week I'm going to Greece, um, seven hours different or eight hours different. And I'm going to bring my grounding mats, which are a recent addition to my daily routine. And my hope is that by sleeping on a grounding mat, I can help synchronize that rhythm, which you're describing is very interesting. I hadn't heard this before. Is actually connected with these electrical eddies in the earth as it rotates in conjunction with the sun. And so my impression is that the way a grounding mat works on your bed is that you have this conductive piece of fabric that's connected to a wall. And that wall has an electrical outlet, which has a ground connected to the earth. So what's so interesting about this to me is that grounding is free for people. You can go out and swim in the ocean or a lake or touch the earth, but we can also be grounded without sleeping directly on the earth by plugging in a grounding mat to a grounded outlet. And I could use that when I travel to help with jet lag. Is that, is that true? Yeah, it, it's totally true. The easiest, if you're traveling, the best thing to do is when you get off the plane and you get outdoors and find some grass or, or pure concrete that isn't painted, just take your shoes off and stand there for 10, 15 minutes. And then your body resinks. Because as soon as you're in touch with the earth, about 15 minutes, it resyncs your cortisol rhythms with the earth, with the time to wherever you are based on sunlight. This is all sun and different things than we are used to using for references, but it's automatic. Just touch the earth for 15 minutes and then it resyncs all of your systems, your cortisol, and your cortisol starts operating normally within, within 15 minutes. That's incredible. This is, like, incredible. this is electrical. This is this is not chemical. This isn't like eating a blueberry. This is electrical. This is speed of light stuff. Yeah, and, and certainly when I go yeah. to Greece, I, go to I will be thinking about the sunlight and I'll be viewing morning sunlight. But now I think when I travel, I will add this intentional grounding as soon as I can when I get off the plane. And yeah, you're gonna feel better. Yeah, and, and I'm gonna bring the grounding mats are easy to travel with, or like you said. You can stand on grass or concrete works. Is it, I can stand on like a yeah. sidewalk and ground. Yes. Yeah. But when you stand on the sidewalk, with your bare feet, move your foot over and you'll see there's moisture. Mm -hmm. it, concrete is earth. It's, it's conductive. Concrete has moisture in it. The chemicals in the concrete won't, won't interrupt the conductivity of the concrete. No, 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 no. And what about on you know, my... I, what about on my bed? So this is a question that I had for you. If I have a grounding mat and I'm sleeping only on a hundred percent cotton sheet, do I need to sleep directly on a grounding mat or can I put a hundred percent cotton sheet over the grounding mat? You can put a hundred percent cotton sheet over the top, but there's more to it than that. The devil, okay. the, you know, the devil's, the devil's in the details. Okay. Um, you know, basically these maps that you're talking about, when we were doing our studies, uh, about the fifth, sixth, seventh year into it, we were making these products that we could ground people with so we could do our tests. We did a lot of biofeedback. We did a, just a, all kinds of variety of tests. Uh, we went, you know, delayed onset muscle soreness. We've done it all, you know, up to the University of Oregon and so on. Um, 
And so in order to do the studies, we had to have something for people to use. And every time we would do a study, and we've done like 30 or 40 of them total now, um, we had to make up products. But all of the subjects always wanted to take the products home with them. Then they come back and they wanted them for their mother and so on and so on. So we created an accidental business. Our objective in the beginning, I'm an electrical guy. My claim to fame is putting data over satellite and feeding it to a personal computer uh, back before the internet existed. You know, so I, I live in, from an entirely different world. But here we are now making bed pads and whatever for people to sleep on. It was nonsense. It was nothing I wanted anything to do with. But on the other hand, people were experiencing such results that we had no option. Morally, we had to make these available to people. So we started to slowly... Uh, make different versions of them. Many of them we had to quit making because we had silver and cotton and they didn't last long enough. They were expensive and they would lose their conductivity and then they weren't producing the results. And so anyhow, one day we sat down, we made a decision. We need to put a product out there that people, first of all, don't have to change their life or do anything different than they're doing right now because they won't comply with it except for a short period of time. So I said, we have to have something simple and then it has to be totally affordable. But most important, it has to work every time, whether it's today or 10 years from now. Because if people are buying this, expecting that it's going to produce what we did and what we illustrated in our studies, then that's why they're buying it. So they're depending on that. So we ended up making a carbon mat. Uh, a lot of people call it a plastic mat. It's not plastic. It's very expensive, very sophisticated, but it's very inexpensive. Uh, it'll last forever and it'll, it, it's 100% conductive. You can't fail. And uh, so anyhow, that's how we got into this product business. Uh, but it's, uh, it, it's a, we have a moral obligation because of what, it, what this does. And, but it's a, not the business. I still prefer to be doing research or promoting research. That's my job. There's millions of people out there that can figure out how to make products. And they do. There's... There's millions and millions and millions of dollars worth of products being sold every day on Amazon. We don't, I mean, Amazon is the biggest seller. You know, they make them in China and put them on Amazon and flood the market around the world. I mean, it's huge around the world because it's something that moms can do and it works. They don't have to know the science. They don't have to care. But most of all, they don't have, they don't have to do anything different. They put it on their bed. And they lay down at night and go to sleep just like they do every night. No work, no extra work. But And then people who want to sleep, if your health is extremely compromised, you have a flaring autoimmune disorder, you need to get on that pad. You need to stay there and stay on that pad and stay grounded until you recover. Your body's a self-healing mechanism. Nature ensured that. All you have to do is remove the stress. It's interfering with your health. And the stress here is the fact that you don't have enough redox potential to reduce the excess radicals that are produced during an oxidative burst. Very, very simple. And, you know, there's hundreds of diseases and hundreds and hundreds of this and that and whatever, but it all comes back to one thing, the immune system. So <clears throat> once you recover and you're, you've got your health back, I'm talking about people who are severely you know, health company, like somebody who has autism. I mean, not autism, but uh, uh, MS. I started out grounding women with MS, put an electrode patch in the palm of their hand, sit there and tell them the story. In 15, 20 minutes, they were a different person. The pain subsided, the inflammation, uh, you know, subsided, uh, they, their demeanor changed, their circulation, you could see their color normalize, uh, and then all of a sudden they were just happy. They still had the damage that was created by the inflammation but the autoimmune disease as soon as you put a patch on and you flood the body with free electrons it's gone it's done you no longer have ms what you have is the ravages and the damage that it was done by ms and the body will heal and recover if you'll tend to it and don't get you got to make decisions to just going to work the most important thing or saving my life the most important thing in many cases that's extreme but you find to find that balance in your life because if Grounding, if being connected to the earth is what normalizes and stabilizes the, the electrical functioning of the immune system, which it does, 
then you, we have to, we have to reinvent our world. We have to re we have to educate first of all, because this is free. It came with birth. I mean, it's a birthright. Uh, you know, we weren't born in the house with houses and shoes and all these things. These are things that we added, and those things are they're, they're the double edged sword. Lots of creature comforts, but lots of health consequences. Yes, well, yeah, said. well said. And I just want to echo something that you were mentioning earlier that I think is really interesting, which is this idea that even looking at the earth, there are diurnal variations, there are daily circadian variations, is perhaps the more accurate term. In the electricity, the electro, the electrical potential of the Earth. This is cr wild to me to think that that there is a circadian rhythm in the Earth's electrical potential, and that touching the Earth at different times of the day is probably just as important as viewing sunlight at different times of the day to set these bodies' circadian rhythm. And this is what you were talking about with the cortisol and these electrical eddies on the surface of the earth, perhaps signaling to the body to have this morning cortisol spike that is the cortisol awakening response. And so it, it's interesting because there's been a lot of talk. Uh, one, of my, one of my friends, Andrew, Andrew Huberman, has done a great amount of work helping people think that you need to look at the sun in the morning. And I, as, I, as I'm reading this stuff and, and learning about your work, I'm struck by the fact that most people are probably doing that like when they're standing on the earth, but if they're not grounding and looking at the sun is probably even, you know, inc exponentially better than just looking at the sun. Yeah. And so then the question becomes for someone, you, you sort of hinted at this for someone who is sick, would the dose of grounding basically be as much as you can get sleep on a grounding mat, rest on a grounding mat, work with your feet on a grounding mat, until you are better? I mean, how much grounding should we be doing as humans? I know this will vary from person to person. Yeah. Again, I use cowboy logic. You know, um, if you want to know the truth about anything, go, go, go down to the creek, sit on a rock and just look at the animals, look at nature, take it all in. It, it's all what it is. You know, there's, there's no, nothing about beliefs out there. It's the way it is, you know. But if I don't see it in nature, I don't really buy into it. I don't promote it for sure. Um, so you specialize in talking about food and stuff, and a lot of what you say is absolutely dead on. And, and I know that from being raised in a ranch and being raised in an agricultural environment where we ate everything out of the garden or we, you know, different. We ate in the seasons. We ate cherries when they were in season. We hoped to get to them before the birds did. <laughs> And, and so on. But there were rhythms in the earth. There's rhythms in everything. And those rhythms were there before we came along. So nature used those rhythms and those clocks and those cueing devices to uh, help build a system that could regulate and help us be who we are and survive. You know, we are the earth. We come from the earth. I used to believe we I came from somewhere, I don't know where, <laughs> but I know I come out of the earth. I eat the earth. I breathe the earth. I walk on the earth. I sleep on the earth. I live the earth. It feeds me. A, it's all a system. I am the earth up walking around. And I don't mean to offend anybody by statements like that, but, but I know this because this is how I grew up and how I lived. And, and I, I know that Health is natural. Health is our most natural state. And uh, I think I lost my point here somewhere. You can bring me back. <laughs> but, it's beautifully said. I appreciate what you're saying there. And, and I have, I completely agree with you. I think that health is our natural state. Um, yes. And, and, and I, I love that word birthright that you said earlier in the podcast. I think that we all have a birthright to profound levels of health and that our medical exactly. system is failing us at a number of different levels in terms of the foods we're told are healthy versus not healthy. And then in terms of the way that we live our lives. I mean, I hope, I hope that one day patients in the ICU are all on grounding mats. I mean, there should be a grounding mat in every single bed in a hospital. Uh, every right. single bed in the hospital should be grounded. And there's no discussion in my entire medical career about grounding for patients. There was no discussion of nutrition, uh, of seed oils and the problems with these uh, completely evolutionarily inappropriate things. So 
I'm, I'm yeah. so aligned with you. I think that perhaps the best teachers are not double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled trials. It's just what we observe happening in the natural world. And just as much for me as humans have never eaten seed oils, we've also right. always been grounded to the earth. Um, I think that the listeners will will benefit from some sort of a prescription from you or some advice from you in terms of how how much grounding should we be doing? I mean, it, it is easier. With, uh, right now, when I'm doing this podcast, my feet are bare feet and they're on a grounding mat. I'm sleeping yeah. on a grounding mat new now, which is a new addition to my regimen. But how much, I guess we should all try and ground as much as possible, but what have you seen? You mentioned earlier that sometimes 15 minutes is enough to reset a circadian rhythm or that someone with pain can see a difference in 10 to 15 minutes. How much should we be thinking about grounding? Because it's it's we can't always be grounding, but interestingly, when I went to do the Minimalist podcast, they had grounding mats and we all sat on grounding mats during the podcast. So how much should we be doing it? Well, what I tell everybody, any amount of grounding is good. If you can only ground for one minute, it's gonna you're gonna reduce a little bit of inflammation, and you're gonna help the blood. Right. Uh, <clears throat> so, any amount of grounding is good. More is better. In nature, you would be grounded twenty four seven, and then you can't have inflammation. If you can't have inflammation, you can't have cancer. You can't have all of these inflammation related autoimmune health disorders. These are all immune dysfunction orders. These are not health disorders. These are immune system dysfunction orders. That's what's, I mean, I don't know if it's the right words to use, but, but, but anyhow, so if your if your health is really compromised and you're in pain and you're in trouble, then you have to make some decisions. You, you have to find earth and dirt and get yourself grounded and stay grounded until you recover. Uh, the body is a self healing mechanism. You just have to remove the stresses so the immune system can go back to work. And that's not easy to do. And it's not easy to understand. And it's not easy to go outdoors. And it's not, people aren't going to go sleep in the ground, in the, in the, in the yard or in the dirt. <laughs> Although many of them could, should. Um, <clears throat> but that's why we made these products. That's why, you know, to give you an idea, uh, to help this make sense, uh, Women are the ones who primarily suffer from autoimmune-related health disorders that we know about and are manifest. And so men do too, but they don't do anything until they have their first heart attack. Um, but but these women, 99% of these products that we sell, we don't really advertise them much. We don't do a lot of anything. That's why you haven't heard of us very much. Um, but... A woman finds grounding, a grounding thing. And she can start with a $59 mat or whatever and end up with maybe a $200, you know, big beds mat or something. And anyhow, she can put it on her bed and she will immediately feel better. She'll start sleeping better. She'll start to get her health back. The number one thing I hear, thank you, I got my health back. You know, thank you for helping me get my health back. Thank you, whatever. And it, it isn't me, it's the earth, of course. And all I'm doing is just the messenger here a little bit. But <clears throat> but the we're not going to change our environment. We're not going to do much of any, we're not most people cannot change economically. They can't change their food most of the time because of the cost of food and the availability of food. Uh, it's I just I don't even like going to Whole Foods. They're, I mean, that's crazy. Some of that stuff. You know, um, it's, it's all mis, you know, misconceptions, but, but the main thing is you have to be responsible for your health. No one can do it for you. There's no pill out there. There's the only thing you can really depend on truly is nature and nature tells you what to do when to do it, if you'll listen. Uh, but, but anyhow, so these sleeping mats are, the only thing we could come up with at this point in time, I'm sure other people will come and make much better ones and much prettier ones and all of those kind of things. But all I'm trying to do is say, we have a problem and we need to fix it. We need to take care of our moms because they're taking care of their mom who's on a dozen meds and they're trying to take care of the, the family and, and their husbands and so on. But the, the mom is at the center of this. She doesn't need another workload. What she needs her health back and she needs to be able to help other people. 
And, and so that's why, but 99% of our products are purchased by moms between the age of 30 and 60, female. Men don't purchase that product because <laughs> they, by and large, they would say, if this were true, I'd known about it. Somebody would have told me about this. I've heard that a hundred times. <laughs> and, and it's not that that's not what it's about, but, but moms, they don't need to know the science. They don't need to know all these things that the male mind needs. <laughs> they need to know that it works. If it works, give me two, give me one for me, give me one for my mom. And then over a period of years, she'll buy another dozen products and give them to her family members or people who need them. She won't try to sell them. She will buy them out of her own money. That's another reason why we try to keep the prices as low as we possibly can, because this is these moms are caregivers. That's all they know to do. If they aren't caregiving, then they go nuts. <laughs> so they need it. They love earthing products because they're inexpensive and they work. And it isn't the earthing products. The earthing products are nothing more than an extension cord that connects you with the earth. It's the earth's energy. It is the earth. It is nature who is healing and restoring your health. I love that. And, and I, I love that you're doing this work. And I, I love what you said earlier that, that there was almost, you basically had a moral imperative. Yeah, I think that yeah. that's good business. When you feel like you have a moral imperative, I, I think that I felt pretty similarly with, with the company that I built called Heart and Soil um, to, to get people organs. And it's the same way. It's not that Heart and Soil is doing, any, is doing any healing for people with these organs. It's the idea that this is just the natural way that humans are supposed to eat the unique nutrients found in organs. And I wanted to be able to get people these organs. So it's, it's very similar. You put it better than I could have. But it, I almost similarly felt a moral imperative to, to help people eat more organs. And I love what you're doing to help people, to educate people. And then if they want, again, earthing is free. You can go sleep on the ground. Yes. You can go camping. You can go put your feet on the earth anytime you want. So it's available to everyone. Uh, you have only to live in a city with concrete. So uh, even when I was in New York City recently, I was grounding and I posted on my Instagram stories. I went over to the East River and stuck my feet in the East River <laughs> because I was yeah. I really wanted, and I was barefoot on wet stones connected with the East River. And, you know, I wanted to, I just, I don't know, I, I felt like I wanted to ground even there. So it is available to everyone almost anywhere on the planet. And, and I, I love that there, that you also felt this moral imperative to just help people connect with where we've come from as humans. So um, where can people find your work and this stuff? And, and thank you so much for the work you do. Well, the earthinginstitute.net is where we store all this information and answer questions. And uh, so anybody that's really interested can go there and find anything they want. They can ask questions and so on. For the products, the, the best products uh, and the best prices are earthing.com. Uh, they they have a nice, don't have a large variety, but a handful of products that will help anybody get grounded, stay grounded, and help you recover. Day-to-day uh, -day lifestyle, that's a little different. We're working with different companies trying to get the shoes out, trying to get various other things out. But, but the main thing is these sleep mats, they're the most important because, again, you don't have to do anything extra. You put them on your bed, you lay down, you go to sleep. The earth does the rest. Nature does the rest. And I, I do think that we need, we need more of these grounded shoes and we need to get people doing this sort of thing, but it's... It's very interesting the way that that all of this is is happening for you know for for humans and and we're sort of remembering where we've come from. So are, are you wearing shoes right now? Let me let me see your feet. <laughs> not I knew it. <laughs> He's not wearing no, shoes. <laughs> my, my feet are on a on a on a grounded yoga mat. Amazing, amazing. Thank you for coming on the podcast. Thanks for, thanks for sharing this stuff with the world. We appreciate it. I appreciate uh, give, they being given the opportunity. And, and uh, yes, just thank God for you. And I appreciate your, your efforts also. Thank you so much, Clint.